This is Duke University. What we're going to do now is I'm really going to preach this sermon. Uh, uh, and uh, therefore the scriptures will be read uh, and um, uh, then um, wow it's kind of play like I hope it will be um, nonetheless um, a sermon so let us begin reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, fear not, say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with the young. The word of the Lord. Thanks. A reading from Second Peter, chapter three, verses eight to fifteen. <clears throat> but do not ignore this one fact, beloved that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is forbearing toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of persons ought you to be in the lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be kindled and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire? But according to his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you wait for these, be zealous to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace." and count the forbearance of our Lord as salvation. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> A reading from the gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold! I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare thy way. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
And there went out to him all the country of Judea and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and had a leather girdle around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I, am not worth, <clears throat> I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, please be seated. In the conclusion to the varieties of religious experience, William James wrote, Though the scientist may individually nourish a religion and be a theist in his irresponsible hours, the days are over when it could be said that for science herself, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Our solar system with its harmonies is seen now as but one passing case of a sort of moving equilibrium in the heavens realized by a local accident in an appalling wilderness of worlds where no life can exist in a span of time which as a cosmic interval will count as but an hour it will have ceased to be. The Darwinian notion of chance production and subsequent destruction, speedy or deferred, applies to the largest as well as the smallest facts. It is impossible in the present temper of the scientific imagination to find in the drifting of the cosmic atoms, whether they work on a universal or a particular scale, anything but a kind of aimless weather doing and undoing, achieving no proper history, and leaving no result. Nature has no one distinguishable ultimate tendency with which it is possible to feel a sympathy. In the vast rhythm of her processes, as the scientific mind now follows them, she appears to cancel herself. The bubbles on the foam which coats a stormy sea are floating episodes made and unmade by the forces of the wind and water. Our private selves are like those bubbles, epiphenomenon, as Clifford, I believe, ingeniously called them. Their destinies weigh nothing and determine nothing in the world's irremediable currents of events. In this eloquent hymn to our nothingness, James gives expression to what I suspect many fear may be the way things are. Staring into the vast darkness, the unending randomness of numberless stars can produce in believer and non-believer alike a sense of diminishment. How dare we, in the face of the purposelessness of the birth and death of solar systems, including our own, believe that our lives count for anything. We exist but for a moment, not only as individuals, but as a species. That the weather, to use William James's language, produce for a brief time creatures conscious of their nothingness suggests that insofar as any purpose can be attributed to the processes that produce such creatures, that process is best described by the word cruelty. Such a view of the world is often thought to be particularly challenging for those who continue to identify with religious traditions. However, those who reject any attempt to account for our existence as determined by God or the gods have a great difficulty justifying their commitment to the human project given the ultimate meaninglessness of our existence. James did his best suggesting that as long as two loving souls clung to one another in a devastated universe, there would still be present real good and real bad things. 
That position, however, has not proved persuasive for many who face the nothingness that surrounds our existence. It cannot be denied that for some the recognition that our lives finally do not matter instills in them a humility that is morally attractive. Believing that our existence makes no difference, they nonetheless try to make a difference. The universe may be hopeless, but they cannot refrain from living lives of hope. The question, of course, remains whether there is any basis for lives so lived. At least one reason for trying to live lives that make a difference is that by so living we hope we will not be forgotten by those who benefit from our trying to make a difference. Yet to ensure we will not be forgotten too often results in desperate manipulative strategies doomed to failure. Civilizations may come and go. Families come and go. Friends come and go. Such coming and going in the face of death signifies nothing. Many who live their lives in the hope of being remembered must face the reality that those they count on to remember them will also be forgotten. We may remember the Hittites. After all, they're mentioned in the Bible. But that we know a people by that name once existed does little good for them or us. Such will be our fate. Some faced by the sheer nothingness of our existence draw a quite different conclusion than the humanists who think it important that we try to be humane. These folks, let us call them realists, recognize that the only alternative is to kill rather than be killed. Life is a struggle. We simply must make the best of a murderous world while we can. Let tomorrow take care of tomorrow. The task is to survive the present. Those who assume such an aggressive stance can appear quite cruel, but they often do not complain when their time comes to be killed. They recognize they had it coming. After all, that's the way life is. But what about us? That is, those of us gathered here to worship God, gathered here in the vague hope our lives are not pointless. Dare we acknowledge that we fear, a fear we suppress through normality. Our faith may be little more than a manifestation of our species' collective narcissism. A narcissism that cannot help but create a god or gods of our liking because we assume they exist primarily to ensure the significance of our existence. The desperate character of a faith so determined is betrayed by our inability to repress our suspicion that we live lives that seem to be no more than roles in a play written by a sadist. The psalmist tells us that the truth shall spring from the earth the earthy character of James' description of our world has the ring of truth. In the very least, we cannot help but admire James' refusal to offer false consolations or hope in the face of nothingness. There is something right as well as ironic about the diminishment of our existence in a world in which we have made our human existence more important than the existence of God. That is why it is surely the case that the only interesting atheism left is not the denial of God, but rather the denial by some of the significance of our existence as a human species. William James was not a prophet. He was a philosopher whose philosophy reflected his profound humanity. Isaiah was a prophet charged by God to cry out to his people Contrasting James and Isaiah no doubt seems comparing apples to oranges, but the similarities and differences they represent help us see how the contrast between facing God and facing nothingness works for how we live our lives. Isaiah had been called by God to a specific task. He was told he was to comfort God's people. The Lord tells Isaiah to speak tenderly to Jerusalem. But what Isaiah is called to cry out 
sounds anything but tender. In response to Isaiah's request, why shall I cry? He's told by God to say to the people of Israel, all people are grass that withers when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Equally important, Isaiah is to remind Israel that her constancy is like a flower that fades in the presence of the Lord. William James would have found Isaiah's comparison of our lives to grass and flowers a confirmation of his sense that our lives are but bubbles on the foam of a stormy sea. For Isaiah, however, this is not bad news, but rather the necessary condition for the recognition that the word of our God will stand forever. For it turns out that the God whose word will stand forever does not exist to fulfill our fantasies that we will not have to die as individuals or as species. Such a God, moreover, does not invite us to presume we can comprehend God's creation. William James, like Isaiah, may rightly remind us that our lives are not the center of the universe. But James is unable to say, as Isaiah says to the people of Judah, here is your God. That God, the God of Israel, is not a God we can force to conform to our purposes. For as Isaiah makes clear, we have been created to conform to God's purpose. This, moreover, is extremely good news because it means that the world as we know it is not without purpose. It can only appear without purpose if we persist in viewing and acting in the world as if God does not exist. The question, therefore, is not, does God exist? But do we? For whatever it means for us to exist, we do so as creatures created, as the universe has been created to glorify God. These last remarks, I fear, are properly called metaphysical. Metaphysics, however, does not have to be, as it sometimes becomes, an esoteric philosophical discipline. Rather, metaphysics is as common as our text from 2 Peter, in which we're told that for the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. That is not an invitation to try to determine the age of the earth, but rather it is a reminder that time itself is God's time. For God's time is eternity. And as God is Trinity, eternity does not mean timelessness, but rather eternity describes the reality of a time that is more than time itself. Peter puts the matter less abstractly by addressing the question some have raised about how slow God seems to fulfill God's promises. Those who despair over God's seemingly unfulfilled promises fail to understand that the time we enjoy is but the form God's patience takes in a world that lacks patience. God's patience allows us all the time we need to be the creatures he created us to be. Again, this is a reminder that to see and act in the world as God's world means that those who see the world through Jamesian eyes and those who see the world as God's world quite literally do not live in the same world. The good news is, however, that to see the world as God's world, as God's good creation, means we have something to do. What we have to do, as Peter writes, is wait for a new heaven and a new earth. That we wait for a new heaven and new earth is to learn to wait for the same one John the Baptist was called to recognize. To learn to wait for this one is to learn to live in peace with one another. To learn to live at peace with one another is to, sure, to be sure we require patience. But as Peter suggests, we are to regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Christian discipleship entails the forming of a people who know how to wait. This is Advent. This is the time of a hastening that waits. Holiness and godliness are the characteristics of a people who have faced God and by doing so have refused the nihilism that threatens all our lives in this time called modernity. Modernity. 
To have seen the face of God in Jesus Christ gives us confidence that time is not a tale told by an idiot, but rather time names God's desire that we participate in God's very life. We are not abandoned. The heavens do declare the glory of God. William James paid close attention to the weather, but he missed the storm that bears the name Jesus. Jesus became one of us subject to the weather, subject to nothingness, and in the process redeemed time, giving us something to do. <laughs> we have been created to be disciples of Jesus. Through baptism into this man's life, death, and resurrection, we are not faced with nothingness, but rather by God's grace, our fate has been transformed into destiny otherwise unimaginable. William James was quite right. We cannot help but appear as an accident, as purposeless as the weather in a world destined for destruction, if Jesus is not the Son of God. To view the world without God's care of us through Christ is to miss the wonder of our existence. <clears throat> James's description of the pointless character of our existence is indeed poetic and elegant, but it lacks the element of wonder through which God first led Israel and now us with them into the miracle of divine love. Once in a burning bush, now in the womb of Mary, the grandeur of creation is made manifest as God himself comes to us, reminding us who we are. We are those who receive him. This is our good work. Christian humanism is not based on the presumption that our humanity is self-justifying. Rather, Christians are humanists because God showed up in Mary's belly. We're not an evolutionary accident. We are not bubbles on the foam that coats a stormy sea. We are God's chosen people. We have been given good work to do in a time when many no longer think there is good work. What an extraordinary claim. What extraordinary good news. Praise God and with gratitude enjoy the glory of God's creation. Together at this time called Advent, let us wait in joyful expectation for the coming of our Lord. Amen. Thank you. I want to say just a few words about that sermon. I wanted when I preached it, I preached it at Christ Church, um, uh, Nashville. Uh, and um, um, I, at, at Christ Church, you, you assume uh, a fairly um, knowledgeable um, congregation. I wanted to articulate what I fear many people think but do not make articulate through the quote from James. Uh, um, the, I could feel the tension in the congregation the three times I preached it at the end of that quote from James <laughs> uh, because I think it does say what many people think they learned in college. Uh, and if it is what they think they learned in college, then why is it not to draw the implication life is eat, screw, and die? Um, that's it. Um, and um, uh, that there is um, no purpose other than the purpose that we impose on what is otherwise a cruel universe. I should say, by the way, I love William James.
Uh, I am, uh, I think he, I mean, he was such a mensch. And, um, uh, and, and a great human being. Um, I mean, the poor man had to survive a father who was a Swinborgian. And um, it, the, the, um, the quote, by the way, comes, uh, one of the great American philosophers is a man named Chauncey Wright, who never wrote a word. Um, uh, he was at Harvard at the time of, of uh, Longfellow James, a purse. And Chauncey Wright had read Darwin and got him right. He understood the issue wasn't um, uh, whether you came, whether humans came from uh, prior species, but that what was at the heart of Darwin was the absolute chanciness of that you exist at all. And James had picked that up from Chauncey Wright. Um, and um, it, um, uh, therefore, um, I used that. Um, I'd known it was there, and I wanted to use it sometime, and the, and the um, uh, text from Isaiah seemed to invite it. When I indicated that uh, the only interesting atheism um, uh, today um, is the denial of the human. There I was, I, I don't, I was drawing on the work of Michel Foucault um, um, because I take it that what is um, uh, interesting about Foucault is um, if the Enlightenment was about the denial of God in the interest of making humanity what it's all about. Um, what Nietzsche and Foucault represented was um, uh, the position that we don't want any God, and that includes the human. So interestingly enough, modern atheism is anti-humanism, and I wanted to suggest that too. Um, I, I try to do that without calling names. I then wanted um, uh, to show how Isaiah uh, is an alternative to, um, though we wither like grass, that our withering is in service to God in a manner that the same realities that James points to are re-narrated um, uh, and that that changes how one views death. So the phrase is not a question of God's existence but ours. Um, it therefore makes that's to make you think twice about the word existence and what you might, how you might think it works. Um, also uh, in, involved in that is the question of the relationship between existence and time. The claim that I was making that God's time is more timely than our time <laughs> is, um, uh, uh, is a, a phrase I learned from Rowan Williams. And um, because time is God's patience and therefore patience is a more determinative way of displaying time than time itself. All that was the kind of thing I was working on without explaining. You say it. Um, um, and then the rhetorical move, and I'm all for rhetorical moves, uh, is um, James missed the storm that was Jesus. Um, uh, I was really pleased when I found that <laughs> um, uh, because I was having trouble figuring out how in the hell do I end this? 
Um, uh, and uh, so it's a, it's a move to a cosmic Christology um, uh, that you see in Mary's belly. I know, I mean, we don't get, we don't get in Mark, of course, uh, Mary. <laughs> but um, uh, I nonetheless made the rhetorical move uh, in, um, uh, to suggest that Mark's uh, gospel uh, was the beginning of a new creation. Um, the thing that you notice about the sermon, and I will um, uh, shut up here after this, is I read it. Now you're taught not to read sermons. Um, and uh, I, um, uh, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong on this either way. But um, uh, I fall in love with the words I use. <laughs> and I don't want uh, to lose them. And since my memory isn't very good, I don't memorize, um, I read. And uh, I think, uh, I, and I, I'm not apologetic about that because I think it says this is, um, uh, this is meant to be attended to very carefully. And so um, uh, I, uh, how you um, understand um, the gestures of reading are uh, are not reading, um, I think um, can go, uh, I don't think there's a right, as I say, I don't think there's a right or wrong about it, but I know for me, uh, reading is um, absolutely uh, crucial uh, for uh, how I am to attend to uh, what uh, I've said. Uh, I'll be, I'd, um, uh, that's enough said. I'd uh, love to get um, your reaction. Do you think that's a sermon that anyone could preach at any church? And why not? Well, I don't, I don't mean to shut that one down, but <laughs> yes. They don't know who William James is. Yeah, I don't think they would know. Yeah. Um, and it was a long quote. Oh, I wanted it to be a long yeah. quote. Um, um, yeah, I don't know how much, that, how much it depends on knowing who William James is. Of course, I mean, uh, James was uh, uh, the great American principles of psychology and um, pragmatism, or James. And um, I did... Um, I did think about that, but I thought, well, the quote is what's important. I thought also, I mean, people love the varieties of religious experience, and they don't know that James, as a matter of fact, didn't believe in God. <laughs> and, I mean, it is, it's, next to the Bible, it's one of the biggest sellers in American um, uh, literature. So uh, that's, that, that's how I decided to go ahead and use James. I don't think it's bad to use um, uh, names that um, uh, people may not recognize. Obviously, I, I mean, one of the reasons I, 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 didn't, I don't use the names of Nietzsche and Foucault, um, but um, because I think those are too specialized. But I thought James might be located for some, some people. Would, but don't you think people will recognize what they think may be the case of, of looking out into the vastness of our solar system today and thinking it's all grass? <laughs> I think that that's, uh, that's there. Yes. I could preach this sermon in my church 
but it would be with some trepidation because I'd be using the words of the great Stanley Hauerwas. Mm. What that makes me think of is that, is that companion years ago, that companion to the Book of Common Prayer, which was the Book of Sermons. Right. For all of those ignorant wretches who didn't know how to write their own. Right. And I don't like to think of myself that way either. Um, but yes, it could be, you know, well, absolutely could be preached. I, I, I would encourage you not to, not to worry about the word plagiarism. Um, uh, it's all plagiarism. Uh, creativity is just forgetting where you read it. Um, <laughs> the, um, um, uh, I, think, um, uh, I think given the quality of the sermons in most Methodist congregations today, I would prefer to write them and have them read my sermons. Um, I, um, uh, and uh, I see absolutely no problem with that. Um, um, uh, namely, um, that it's a way of representing the fact that we're not preaching our opinions, we're preaching the church's faith. And we hold ourselves to that uh, in a way that Therefore, um, um, at, at, um, at Easter, um, uh, at Holy Family, we read um, Chrysostom's wonderful, Clark, what is that? Um, it's, it's East, he was, <laughs> huh? It's the Easter sermon. It's the Easter sermon. And I love that. I, I, you know, uh, he, was, he was reviled. He was embittered, that's right. He was embittered. I just love that. And, um, uh, I, and if we don't do it every year, I would be deeply disappointed. Um, 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 so that, I think that that um, makes um, uh, a certain amount of sense for somebody to read, just to say, I read this sermon. And um, on, for the text for the day, and I'm going to read it <laughs> to you. <laughs> um, I mean, um, because uh, uh, the sermon doesn't have to be um, uh, just my stuff. I mean, creativity and that, um, I, I don't see any reason that, that um, we ought to uh, value that. Anita? Whenever I'm wanting to introduce an example from the natural world, it's because I want it to speak to a universal experience. But there's that challenge of bringing something from a, a particular scientific discipline, is that going to be so particular <laughs> that even though it's a universal occurrence, it doesn't really touch everyone. But what I'm really trying to do is speak to what is the reality of our existence. For example, nothingness. Uh, I struggled with this with the sermon on Ash Wednesday when I thought about how do I talk about the fact that we are 99.9% .9 nothing. And I just want some advice on how to introduce something like this but keep it at a level where people can relate to it universally without stepping into particular experiences like the one you mentioned of talking about your seven-year-old daughter. Yeah, dust you are and to dust you shall return is as good as it gets. Um, uh, I, um, I, don't use off, I don't usually appeal to that, that kind of exemplification through science. Uh, um, I usually work on something like um, I ask people how they want to die. Uh, people today want to die quickly, painlessly, in their sleep and without being a burden, right? They don't want to be burdens because they don't trust their children. Uh, <laughs> they want to die quickly, painlessly, in their sleep because when they die, they don't have to know they're dying. So now we ask physicians to keep us alive to the point that when we die, we don't have to know we're dying, and then we get to blame physicians for keeping us alive to no point. Uh, so it's, it's that, um, 
yeah, and then I usually make reference to um, the great litany where we pray to be saved from a sudden death. Um, uh, and we, we pray to be saved from a sudden death because um, at one time what people feared was God. Now they fear death. So we, we don't want to have to live into our deaths. Um, so we just want to live to the point that when we die, we don't have to know we're dying. And to make it very concrete that way, because I'm, you know, people can see it and then you say, well, why, why in the great litany are we, being, are we praying to be saved from a sudden death? We're also being be saved from war, etc. cetera, uh, in that same um, uh, litany. So um, uh, I, I think that what you, you look for uh, is the kind of concreteness that impinges on our lives in that way. I don't, um, it might, um, I, I'd be careful with the word universal. Uh, I don't, um, uh, I don't know, the word universal invites an abstractness that, um, um, all you that um, makes it very hard for people to recognize that's me. I, I mean, uh, where do you get um, uh, where do you get a sense of uh, of, for example, um, a sense of finitude? Read Faulkner's *The Bear*. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's, in the, it's in the concreteness of the exemplification that we are able to see the see that's me too. So um, uh, it's um, uh, that's that's the kind of thing I would look for. Also, you have to be careful with examples. Uh, examples um, can be extraordinarily abstract. Um, I'm not, um, I'm, you know, alleged, I hate the phrase narrative theology, um, um, which I'm allegedly one of the proponents of. Um, 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 I mean, theology is theology. Christian is quite enough. Um, but um, uh, I... Um, I think um, the use of stories in, um, in sermons um, um, uh, certainly they um, it's a good uh, it's a good thing that we have to relate narratives but the, they should never trump the narrative that is the gospel. So how, um, I mean, what I tried to do here, for example, was to, quote, out-narrate, that's Milbank's phrase, to out-narrate James's quote. <laughs> so you, you um, uh, without necessarily calling attention to it, you're, you're telling the story, but you're not necessarily um, calling attention to that. I mean, there was a, once the, the narrative stuff hit, hit the fan, um, then people started talking about narrative preaching and all that. I, I find it, I find it um, that way of thinking um, uh, not helpful uh, in terms of the kinds of discipline that the sermon uh, requires. Yes. Yeah. Um, so one thing I've, um, well, I guess in response to your question, I, th I feel like that sermon could be preached in my congregation. Yeah. Chapel of the Cross. I mean. Yes. Um, 
Something that um, I find more challenging and wonder if you could speak to since we're on death um, is preaching texts that um, really are driving at a specific kind of death, which is martyrdom for your faith. So just to give a quick example, Randa did this on Tuesday, um, reading about the anointing at Bethany. And I remembered Sam Wells saying something in a lecture, and I went and looked it up. And he talks about Mary preparing Jesus for death and how Jesus does that to us, to the disciples, and, and tells the disciples that we should all do it to each other at the foot washing. And it, he kind of tears apart a notion of Christian life of service as giving back and otherwise living our lives as we normally would. And he's really talking about dying for our faith in union with Jesus. So preaching that kind of thing to, you know, a congregation post-persecution um, age, people are busy with careers and parenting, they know I live a bourgeois life, <laughs> and so preaching this martyrdom in that kind of context, they're sort of lifting up a few examples like Daniel Berrigan or somebody like that, there's talking about um, a kind of vocation where we offer our lives, try to integrate that as a prayerful offering, but they all seem to fall short. I wonder if you have any advice for that. Uh, say what you just said. Say what you just said. Say, say what you just said. That's a sermon. I mean, wh namely that, um, uh, that we no longer know what to do with martyrdom. And why is that? <laughs> how, how, did we, how did we end up in that uh, circumstance? Uh, actually, um, uh, um, you might... Um, I, I mean, one of the ways I put it is, um, namely... Um, why is it, as Christians, we're no longer frightened by being Christian? <laughs> I mean, it, it's a dangerous thing. Um, and so, um, uh, just to put it without, I mean, it's perfectly all right in sermons to raise challenges for which we have no answer. And so, you put it wonderfully eloquently um, uh, about why we can't comprehend this text. <laughs> and that's what I think you say. And that's, that's good news. <laughs> Namely, um, just to the extent we can't comprehend this text gives us some sense of what it means to confess our sin and to know how to go to go on. I, um, I mean, how do we deal with um, um, the fact that on the whole we're rich? And Christians and money is always a problem. <laughs> um, uh, how do we, um, uh, you know, I didn't try to be rich. I'm just a full professor at a research university. I make a hell of a lot of money. Um, uh, I didn't know I would do that. Um, I don't know in what ways it's getting in the way of, of my being able to live as a Christian. But I, it needs to be made as, at least as part of the challenge. You cannot serve God and mammon. Um, so um, uh, there's every reason in the world to um, 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 put it just the way you put it that um, uh, we're not sure what to make of that, but we're in connection with Christians that are. That's, uh, so exactly one of the things that um, I think the sermon does is help us locate our lives in relationship to lives in other uh, places that um, remind us 
that we don't necessarily exemplify what it means to be Christian. Now, Ellen oftentimes calls forward the Sudan in ways I don't particularly like because I don't want to. I don't want to be Sudanese, but I know that they live. They they're forced to live as Christians without money in a way that I couldn't will, and therefore it's it's a way for me to understand that um, uh, that what it means to be Christian today isn't limited to us. But it's, it's a terrific, um, um, and the way you put it, I thought was uh, wonderfully uh, eloquent. Yes. To do a little time travel here, <laughs> because time plays such an important part in locating us in the sermon. I don't mean to be funny or too abstract, but when you ask the question, could this sermon be preached in any church? Could you preach this sermon in the church that your parents went to? Um, Without talking to Israel. Yeah. Um, um, I think I would. I don't think. I think I could preach it. I don't know that I would if I were if I were given the opportunity to preach. As a matter of fact, um, um, uh, I, I tell you, you've read Hannah's Child, probably. My mother and father, my father was a bricklayer. Um, I come from working class folks, and um, we went to uh, Pleasant Mound United Methodist Church, which my father was the general contractor on. Uh, and, um, um, I tell the story about the building of the church and so on in Hannah's Child. And um, uh, there was um, a reception uh, for the book at the Society of Christian Ethics. And there was this lady there that I didn't recognize. And it turned out uh, that it was sponsored by Erdman's. And it turned out She's the pastor of Pleasant Mound United Methodist Church, and they had paid for her to come. And that church is now moving from being working class white to working class African American. She's an African American. And um, uh, she asked me to come and preach. <laughs> so I did. Uh, I did, um, and that uh, the sermon is in a uh, cross-shattered um, uh, church. Um, um, and um, I, didn't, I didn't play at all a successful guy coming home um, uh, because I, um, I just um, um, preached... Um, the, what I thought was the gospel for that day in a way that um, wasn't celebratory for the occasion. And I knew that that was disappointing for some people, but I thought that's what I would be required, what I was required to do. And um, um, if, to be honest to them in terms of that, so I have preached there. I didn't preach that sermon, but I. Um, but it was a great honor to be able to go back. Yes. One more. Um, I'm wondering if the question of could you preach this, blah blah blah, is the best question. Uh huh. And I'm, I'm wondering if, because to me it feels like, is this a product that your congregants would buy, mm -hmm. rather than. Um, a better question, a different question that would be more about what are you called to do in the moment. I'm just wondering if uh -huh. you can. Uh huh. Boy, that's good, and um, I, it never occurred to me whether they buy it. It's whether they could hear it. Um, uh, and um, uh, the um, and but your question is. Um, 
okay, there's a kind of aesthetic um, uh, overwhelming of certain responses to what seems to be the purposelessness of the universe implied in evolution. So what? <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I make the Christological move at the end, but um, so what? Where do you go from there? And um, uh, there's, there's probably more going on in that sermon than, than should be to begin with, but um, uh, I would think that would need to be taken up. So what? I mean, that's what you're asking, isn't it? Well, I, I, I'm just trying to get to the point of we, who know, there are a million different responses right. that congregations are going right. to have. And if we're constantly thinking, is this person going to be able to hear, if it's constantly contextual, uh -huh. how do we move beyond context when we're developing and when we're discerning what it is we're called to say in the moment? How do we move beyond context? Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I have, see, I, I mean, implied in that is I want to take the biologist that teaches at Vanderbilt and say, you need to be intellectually challenged by this in a way that you have to rethink how, as a matter of fact, um, the way you teach biology may underwrite a purposeless view of the universe in a way that is implicitly atheistic. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've got that agenda going, but I don't make that part of the sermon itself. Um, um, I don't even know if there was a biologist in the uh, congregation. But I do have, I do want to think that there are intellectual challenges there that mean that Christians are going to have to rethink some of their intellectual formations that they've just assumed is okay. And so that's, uh, that's probably not an adequate answer at all. Thank you very much. Oh, excuse me, David. Thank you, Steve. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.